some of the everyday activities that um, people still have to continue to be able to do after um, they get diagnosed with a brain tumor and then proceed through treatment. One of the things that we find is that as survival periods increase and as we get better and better um, with treating various types of brain tumor, then um, patients really start to think about things like quality of life. And one of the things that really impacts quality of life is cognitive functioning. And certainly cognitive dysfunction is really common in all types of brain tumors, um, ranging from around 30% um, to all the way up to 90%, which is more common with um, more metastatic brain tumors or tumors from other types of cancers. One of the things that we know is that even prior to all the different types of effects that we'll, I'll talk about with respect to treatment, is that when patients first present to their physicians with um, whatever type of brain tumor it is, that there are already um, existing cognitive deficits at that point. So they're kind of going into treatment with some existing deficits. So when I talk about cognitive functions, so all kinds of this here, this is just to give you a sense of some of the things that um, someone like myself um, or other psychologists working with patients are going to be thinking about. So really simply, affect or emotions. So our ability to regulate our emotions, our ability to identify emotions, to have appropriate emotions in certain contexts motor um, function, so this is certainly where, um, as Matthew Mom talked about, um, that loss of function on one side of his motor control, various types of cerebral tumors, you'll see coordination issues, um, automaticity of some of the motor actions that if all of, when all of you sat down in your chairs, you didn't really have to think about that. All those kind of automatic functions that we have can be impacted depending on the type of tumor the person has. Sensory aspects, um, you can have changes in taste, in smells, hearing, um, your vision. As Dr. Marie can point out, a number of the tumors will affect uh, vision, as well as tactile sensations. Then we start looking at things like memory. Memory tends to be one of the areas in a lot of brain tumors that's impacted. And we have different types of memories. We have visual memory, we have auditory memories your short-term, long-term, and so on, okay? And so all these types um, of functions are going to be impacted differently depending on the type of tumor that the person has, as well as the type of treatments that are required afterwards. Language is a, a, a people find gets impacted um, when they have brain tumors or as a result of the treatments. So language tends to be a really important part of people's lives. It's how we communicate with each other. Okay, it's how we understand a lot of the world around us is by language. Attention. Attention is probably one of the biggest areas impacted. Um, whenever someone has a brain tumor, attention tends to be one of the big complaints. Okay, for various reasons that I'll talk about. So we have visual attention. Can I pay attention when I'm reading? Does my vision skip around on the page? Can I pay attention when someone's speaking? All of us have probably been in school at some point and Hopefully not at this point <laughs> when someone's speaking and you're like, wow, I just lost half of what they said. Hopefully it wasn't important, right? Um, not now, of course, because it's really stimulating. Um, but, or divided. You know, um, when have you been doing anything <coughs> talking to you and you realize, yeah, you might know what that person said because we're not really good at dividing our attention even on a good day. So that's something that definitely gets impacted. Selective attention, being able to focus on what you want to focus on. Okay. All of us have probably been in one of those moments where you're trying to concentrate on something and there's an annoying noise in the background. Okay. Um, so even here, we have ambulances going off, the fire alarm constantly. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many times like, I'm trying to write a report and that's going off. That definitely affects selective attention and sustained. How long can you maintain your attention? Um, all of these things are really important because attention is the gatekeeper to the rest of our brain functions. If we can't pay attention to things, it's hard to remember them. It's hard to focus on someone's language. So, like I said, if someone's speaking and all of a sudden your attention wanders, you don't know what they've said. So how do you respond? Okay? How do you even keep track of what you're saying? 
So attention is a very important function. And then we get up to what's called executive functions. This is a really wide range of abilities that people have. So this is things like, can you plan your day out? Can you organize yourself to get to work on time? Um, that's a function that a lot of people have difficulty with, even on a good day. Working memory is one that a lot of people struggle with. Um, certainly, um, as we talk about different aspects of chemo and radiation and so on, working memory tends to get affected. Can you do an arithmetic problem in your head? Can you calculate things while you're doing something else? Okay, it's a very important function. Can you listen to what someone's saying while trying to think of a response? Or does that interfere? Being able to regulate yourself is a big one. Um, certainly, a lot of people when they first come in um, with a brain tumor, depending on where it is, if this has been affected, people will notice behavior regulation issues. So they may say things that other people wouldn't normally say in that social setting. Um, we all have thoughts, we keep to ourselves. Um, we don't necessarily say everything that comes into mind. For some people, if this has been impacted, they may just blurt that out. Like, wow, is that ever an ugly sweater? <laughs> normally you wouldn't say that, you would simply acknowledge in your head that it was an ugly sweater and move on, right? Um, not something that will make you popular with other people, so it can really impact social function. Being able to monitor yourself. Um, certainly, if your boss is talking to you, are you monitoring whether you're making facial expressions that aren't appropriate? So rolling your eyes when talking to your boss, I don't recommend it. Um, so those types of things. Mental flexibility. If your plan changes, are you okay with that? Or does it really bother you? For some of us, certainly, I'm a psychologist, you know, it's very like to have, you know, it's organized and set a certain way. But most of us can adapt, okay? But that's where, think about all the things that you do on a daily basis that you need to be flexible for. Okay, so, oh, there's cars that now I gotta take a different route to work. All those sorts of things. Sequencing. Can you put things in the sequence that they're supposed to? Earliest sequence that most people remember? The alphabet. Okay, so it's one of the things where if people start to not be able to do even that basic thing, how do you then sequence the steps to cooking? How do you sequence the steps to getting dressed? None of you have underwear on the outside of your clothes. Therefore, I'm assuming that you can sequence. Okay? So those are important aspects of kind of day-to-day -day functioning that we have to think about because now our patients are surviving longer. And so to make them functional on a daily basis, you need to be able to, A, understand how all these treatments are going to impact it, how the tumors are going to impact it, and then how do we start helping people function with respect to these things? If anyone has questions at any time, feel free to ask. So, what effects do we see in cognitive function? Okay, certainly there are direct effects, such as tumor progression, um, both before, <coughs> during, and after treatment. Um, certainly any changes in the tumor, um, any sort of impingement on the actual normal tissue, we can have changes in the cognitive function. Okay. Seizures are a big one. Um, certainly certain types of seizures, especially those um, that last for a prolonged period of time, can actually damage the neural tissue. So if we don't have good seizure control, um, people can go into what's called status lepticus, um, which is a prolonged seizure, and that can cause damage in itself. Indirectly, we have lots of effects, okay? So certainly indirectly, we have perineoplastic syndrome, endocrine syndrome, so our hormones may um, impact our abilities to process information. Um, certainly, uh, as you guys have mentioned, the steroid changes, um, lots of different things where a lot of different systems can be impacted throughout your body that then impact our cognitive function. Anti-epilepsy meds and other medications, certainly um, the anti-epilepsy meds, while of course they're necessary for seizure control, is that they do have side effects. One of the biggest ones is sedation. People feel slow and they get, what they really refer to as this like, really sluggish cognitive tempo, like, oh, it's like trying to think through blood. Um, and it's probably one of the biggest complaints of people who are on these types of medications. Some of the neuromeds, much better, um, they have less sedation, but even still, um, a lot of people complain of the sedation with those, 
as well as attention issues. Um, because we can't think quickly, A, it's taking longer for your information to get through your brain, um, and these medications will impact your attention. So if you think, okay, my attention isn't able to kind of stay focused on something and now it's harder to think through something, by the time you've gotten through the first little bit of information, your attention has gone and wandered off. So you've lost it. You have to go back to the beginning. Um, I've had patients describe reading as the most painful thing they can do because by the time they get through the sentence, they've lost the first part of the sentence. Now they have to go back. Um, and you can imagine if you were trying to complete a university degree, um, if you were even just trying to complete grade two, where they do a lot of reading, this is a problem. Okay. Certainly, um, radiation um, has been one of the areas where we've done a lot of research um, because it's probably one of the biggest culprits in terms of creating cognitive effects. Um, so we're looking at about 50 to 90 percent of patients um, will have some sort of cognitive effect following um, whole brain irradiation. Um, some things that we see here, verbal memory tends to be affected. So can I tell you a story about my day and you remember it tomorrow? Okay. Um, can you remember a list of things at the grocery store? I mean, I can't do that on a good day, so I have um, electronic devices for that purpose. But you can imagine how frustrating it is where a spouse they come home, tell their stress how their day went, and then the next day they don't remember. Okay? Or even the next hour, they don't remember. Um, so that gets really frustrating, um, especially within social relationships, because we have that expectation of that, that people are going to remember details of our lives. Okay? Certainly spatial memory, um, how to get to the grocery store. Um, a friend of mine, she had radiation, and I got a call from her one day, um, because she she was lost, and it was in a city that she lived in her entire life, but she could not feel like her thing kept how to get back. <laughs> because she couldn't map out the city in her mind anymore. Radiation also severely impacts attention. So again, we've got all these other things that are impacting attention, and we've got another culprit for attention. Okay, and so again, it's one of those ones that's going to impact most areas of that person's life. We also have things like problem solving that get targeted by radiation, particularly whole brain uh, radiation. And so if you think about it, how many new things did you have to figure out today? Because every time something changes slightly, that's a whole new problem. So maybe you're running out of dish soap. How do you figure out how to get more? How do you figure out what to do if, oh, none of my socks are coming? I'm hoping that somewhere in there is like a washing machine, but you know, um, potentially you have to figure out, okay, I have to go somewhere, what do I do if I don't have any clean socks? Or what do I do if there's no gas in the car? Um, and so, so many problems that we deal with on a daily basis are things that you probably don't even think about, where you don't have to plan out the steps. But with whole brain irradiation in particular, we can run into problems where people can't actually generate the ability to solve some of those everyday life problems because of whole new problems to them. Whereas most of us can adapt to new situations. We've gotten better with um, irradiation, but now we're much more focused with it. Um, that has helped to bring down some of these effects. Attention still tends to be one of the ones that gets impacted, um, and then any of the brain functions in the areas that are being irradiated are going to be impacted. Chemotherapy is another one. Um, a lot of people have a chemo brain. Um, again, really sluggish cognitive tempo where people are just slow to process information, um, and it's work to get through that. Um, again, sludging too much, right? trying to think. If everyone's trying to think when they had a head cold, it's like that. Right? Where things that normally would be really easy are just like, why can't I get this? Um, and it's one of the ones that tends to be really frustrating for patients. Um, because before, didn't have to think about it. And now, everything is hard. Especially when you're also having <coughs> attention difficulties, which chemotherapy will also bring about. And so again, it's losing information and not being able to pull things together fast enough 
in order to maintain their attention on things. Some of the other things, um, learning tends to be impacted, so new learning of information. A lot of that is because of the interaction with the attention system. So if you don't pay attention to something, it's not going into memory. Okay? So a lot of people will complain about memory difficulties when they come in. Um, oh, I can't find my keys. Oh, I'm losing stuff all the time. I can't remember people's name. And it's actually because of attention. Because usually when we put down our keys, we're not actually paying attention to where we left them. And so everyone's probably in the morning been rushing around trying to find stuff. And it's because at the end of the day, you weren't paying attention to it. So imagine that's your entire world where your attention system wasn't paying attention to what it needed to in order for you to remember it. And so that gets really frustrating, okay? As well as having conversations with people. Everyone's probably had a conversation with someone who isn't paying attention to you. Right? So you can tell they're like, oh, looking over there, mm -hmm, and you can just tell they're not with you. Um, that's where the lot of spouses will report, where you know I'm talking to them and it feels like they don't care anymore. And it's not actually that they don't care, it's that their attention system can't regulate it. <coughs> So you can pull into having that one-to-one -one eye contact, um, having that really focused um, attention onto whatever it is that you're talking about. What we found is that because a lot of patients will have a combination of both radiation and chemotherapy, is that um, certainly in the literature it's been all over the place as to whether or not this is worse. Um, for the most part, it does seem to be more severe the impacts that we get when people have both radiation and chemotherapy. Um, but some of the results <coughs> are both are with just radiation alone, at least with whole brain radiation. We can definitely get a lot of symptoms that result from the combination of the two of them that will then um, end up making people's cognitive difficulties, say if they only had chemo before and then if they add in radiation is that they find that their symptoms are much worse. Neurosurgery, of course, um, while it's fantastic because obviously to remove the tumors that are removable is great. However, we're going into the brain and we're cutting things out. Um, and so any of the neural tissue that's impacted, um, functions can be lost as a result of that. Um, sometimes we can get really good recovery from surgery, uh, depending on where uh, the tumor actually is in the brain, uh, whether or not they've been able to access it easily. Um, so certainly with through Cerebral tumors, we can get a little bit better um, if they're between the outside um, of the cerebral cortex. But if they're really, say, smack dab in the middle, that's a lot harder because then you have to cut through healthy tissue in order to get to the tumor. Okay? Um, and so we can have a lot of side effects of that as well. Although, again, that's getting a lot better with some of the newer techniques where the cuts are smaller. So we see less deficits following that. Um, but you can imagine, if someone's had to have all of these, how many cognitive side effects they're now having, um, and how frustrated um, patients start to get. So, we also have other related effects on the cognitive function. Fatigue. Everyone here is really tired at some point. We know that you don't think as well when you're tired. Okay? Um, all of these types um, of treatments really fatigue patients. Um, certainly, with respect to attention, again, gets knocked out by fatigue. Um, I'm sure everyone's had those moments where you didn't get enough sleep and then you have a staff meeting, no sense of being that way, and you're sitting there and you're trying to focus. And you're just falling, like you can't bring it around. Same thing. Um, anxiety and depression is really common in patients, <coughs> much for a variety of reasons. Um, a lot of it is the cognitive side effects that happen because they get frustrated. It impacts social functioning. Um, if all of a sudden your spouse is annoyed because you can't pay attention to them, um, or in class your teacher keeps getting mad at you because you can't pay attention and you can't regulate yourself well enough to be that student that you used to be. Um, and so now um, you start to see people developing depression, anxiety, has been thought of as an actual side effect of some of the actual treatments. So there is some evidence to suggest that human therapy in particular actually increases um, the experience of anxiety in people's brain because it reduces some of the emotion regulation piece. And so people will actually get it as a side effect of 
Also, that that's what the zone is carrying. Yeah, and yeah. So yeah, there's a number of medications that people are on right? that um, can really change how people are feeling in terms of depression and anxiety. The old weight gain, and it really bothers people as well um, with the steroids. Um, a lot of people get a lot of weight-related issues around that, especially if they have a spouse, that can cause problems there as well. Sleep disturbance is really common. Um, I don't know if that's your experience with a lot of your patients as well. Um, and again, that's where you're going to get more fatigue um, and more difficulties with this. And then pain. Um, a lot of people experience different types of pain as a result of treatments, as <coughs> um, they have uh, tumors and cancer in other parts of their body as well. Uh, and so that's where now pain in particular, unfortunately attention takes another hit uh, from pain. So again, imagine a patient who has all of these, um, their ability to actually maintain attention focus is going to be really challenging for them. So what do we do? Certainly pharmacology is starting to come a long way. The neurostimulants, um, for a lot of people, they may be familiar with methamphetamine, otherwise known as Ritalin. Um, so what we've learned from kids who have attention deficit disorder is that Ritalin works for attention. And so now we start to use it with other populations. Um, and certainly now we start to find um, people with, most of the research is done with primary brain tumors versus metastatic, but um, we're starting to do bigger studies um, as well with them. But what we have found is that we do see improvements. So not only in attention, mood tends to increase as well. Um, speed of being able to do tasks, initiation of tasks improves. So we actually see quite a few improvements using the neurostimulants. And not just for them, there's a few other ones. Um, when daffodil is another one that they've used with primary brain tumors, and again, really, um, you see a lot of improvements in terms of attention, as well as other cognitive functions, um, but we think it's because of the improvement in attention that's actually leading to that. Um, as well, it can help fatigue. Okay. Um, how many of you drank coffee this morning? A lot of coffee cups, and I said a lot of importance cups when I came in this morning. That's why we drink it. It's because it helps us not feel so tired, right? And it helps us focus. Um, and so we can use that as an adjunct to be able to help patients be able to pay attention a little bit better. Some of the medications that we start to use now um, in mild to severe Alzheimer's have also started to um, be used in some of the bigger studies. We've had some mixed um, results, but certainly um, We've had some improvements in terms of mood and overall rate of quality of life, but not necessarily on any testing. So that's where now they have to figure out, is it really that it's maybe a placebo effect? Um, just taking something that might help improve cognitive function is making them feel better, or is there a secondary effect that um, we're not aware of as of yet in terms of the testing? So that's still out. Um, in terms of kind of on a general basis, you would want to give that, but certainly the statements have good evidence. And then we have cognitive rehab, which is really where neuroscience comes in. Um, so we have two different types. We have restorative and compensatory. So restorative is exactly what it sounds like. We're trying to actually restore brain function. Okay, that's good and loss. And then compensatory is finding out other ways to do the exact same thing. Okay, um, most of the time. A lot of our tools are going to be compensatory, um, but some of the evidence has actually suggested that teaching people other ways of doing things actually results in restoration of some of the function. Uh, so we end up kind of doing both all at once. So one of the things, um, and I was lucky enough to work with Katie Matier, she's um, a very famous kind of neuropsychologist in um, rehab in particular. And for her, she actually had a major brain injury just before defending her dissertation. Um, and so she actually developed this after that um, because her attention was so poor. So she didn't really feel comfortable seeing patients until she could actually pay attention much better. Because anyone who's been with patients knows she actually has to focus on what they're saying. Um, and you're not generally a good clinician if you're paying attention to what someone's saying to you. 
So she um, and her partner, Kim Kearns, actually created an actual kit um, that can be used with patients to train our attention. And we actually have really good evidence that this helps to actually restore attention function. The downside to these, these are excessively boring tasks. Like, <laughs> boring, I can't tell you. So things like alphabetizing words. So I'll say a sentence, and you have to alphabetize all the words that are in that sentence. Okay? Um, and do this over and over and over again. Okay? We can do this if you do boring tasks at home. Okay? If you make yourself sit down and do things that are long, boring tasks. You're essentially kind of doing similar, similar things. The reason this is an interesting process now is because a lot of us are not good with sustained attention tasks on a given day. Because our attentional resources are actually reduced um, compared to what they used to be because of how much we use technology. How many of you fast forward through commercials? Most of you? Okay. Or get up and go do something. Um, or if you have a slower time on the computer than you normally would, do you get frustrated? Yeah. So when computers first came out, um, on a general basis, I was in high school, that dates me a little bit, but um, I remember how slow they were. And um, hung around, like, see the little circle going around and around and around, and just had to wait because there was no other option. Now, a lot of times you're like, oh, maybe I need to go on another network or something, even if it's like a split second longer than what it used to be. So, um, everyone can probably benefit from doing more boring tasks. Um, but certainly, yeah, pencil, pen and pencil tasks, um, mental math, doing all those types of things this is how we train our attention system to actually be stronger. And so, this is where we can get patients. <coughs> to be able to do some of these tasks in order to actually improve some of their ability to sustain their attention and to focus on things. So if I make people do a task that's like, say, detecting targets, so I'll have a page full of numbers and say, OK, I want you to go through and process all the sevens, and only sevens. Okay? And they have to do that over and over again. They get much better at selecting targets on a page, so, which is beneficial for improving reading in particular. So we see a lot of good results with attention process training. Typically, you don't want to be doing these types of things right when someone is in the middle of chemo. Um, we haven't had as good of results. Um, same thing like in brain injury, you can't do it early on um, because of some of the changes that are occurring in the brain. Some of the neurochemistry uh, seems to be interfering with actually improving the attention. But once they're done the chemo, um, and generally we usually wait about a month afterwards and then we can start doing these types of things. Some of the things that people can do on a daily basis, certainly doing boring tasks, making yourself wait through commercials. Um, you can see tonight just how painful that is when you're watching your favorite shows. Um, being able to do orientating procedures. So while doing a task, what am I doing? So what am I supposed to be doing next? So bringing yourself back to the task. Um, it's an interesting thing because in neuroscience we've been doing that for a long time and now there's this whole um, approach of mindfulness, right? Um, so being present in the moment. That's essentially what mindfulness is about and that's exactly what these orientating procedures are. It is really kind of saying, okay, if I'm in the middle of a task, am I actually doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Um, certainly a lot of us will get involved in doing stuff and then be like, oh wait, I was supposed to do this first. Hold on, I need to go back. Um, and that's where we can actually train people to set timers for themselves. Okay, so at five minutes you're going to check, are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Okay, so has your attention wandered, essentially? Okay. Pacing. How long do you go before you take a break? Most of us don't think about it. We just kind of, we have to finish a certain task, then we do it. Okay. So think about how long can you go before you need a break? It's in the staff meeting, perhaps. How long do you think you can pay attention for? 10 minutes? <coughs> yeah, 10 to 15 minutes is about how long most people can go before their attention starts to wander. <coughs> Even worse if someone's really monotone and talking about something you don't really care about. 
can reduce his head attention span even lower. Um, but certainly that's where teaching people to do that because we don't naturally do that, especially as adults. Certainly kids aren't great at doing that naturally either, at figuring out, okay, I need to take a break. Um, how long of a break, what type of things. It's things that we can actually teach people. And now, especially with um, some of the external aids that we have, like cell phones, a lot of people carry cell phones. Um, there are watches that have timers and so on in them. We can set timers, okay? When you're doing a task, we set your timer every five minutes, it cues you. As do, okay you need to take a break, or every 10 minutes, depending on how severe their attention difficulties are. Key ideas log is this is where one of the big frustrations for people when they have attention difficulties is, I just lost this great idea, or I totally forgot what I was supposed to be doing. So key ideas log um, can be electronic, can be pen and paper. Um, <coughs> just give them a tiny little notebook, um, and then write down everything. Like, who was it that you were supposed to talk to? Write the name down. Um, <laughs> Steve's got one of those little notebooks, actually, yeah. that he carried down in his back pocket. These are great ideas. Um, certainly, yeah, I find notebooks are easier because you know, I have to log in to your phone and um, start texting and stuff like that. I'm not as fast. So um, people who are faster may like the electronic ones. But then that way, the information is there. They don't have to keep maintaining it in their attention system in order to be able to do anything with it. Okay. Environmental modification is essentially figure out what environments work better for the person. Um, certainly, like a classroom setting like this, extremely distracting for someone who has attention problems. Um, because it's like, oh, look, Jane's got purple on today. Oh, look, you've got red. Oh, look, that person's moving over there. Oh, what are they doing over there? Oh, that person's yelling at the moment. They're tired. And now the person in the front of the room who was talking, yeah, it's gone. Okay. Um, same thing if someone's having a conversation with someone. You imagine you're standing in the hallway in the hospital. Stuff going on all around you. There's noises going on around you. Fire alarm. <coughs> <laughs> 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 so, how can you tell this one of my pet peeves? Uh, yeah. So that's where it's like you can figure out, okay, if someone has to do something important, what kind of environment do they have to be in in order to be able to pay attention? Um, and so those are things that we can do where we might need to have production of clutter. I'm sure no one here has any clutter in their home. I'm sure everything's really nicely organized. Um, my space, of course, is perfect, yeah. Um, but that's where getting rid of clutter, because clutter is attention grabbing. So if you have a whole bunch of papers stacked around somewhere, um, and sure no one's office looks like this, but if you have a whole bunch of papers stacked out there, is that then your eye is drawn to all the different lines of those pieces of paper versus having it in a stack like that. Okay. So something as easy as that has now simplified their environment. Okay, so we can actually have people that are professional organizers that can come into patients' homes and modify the environment so that it's much um, simpler in terms of attention. And then external aids. This is one of my favorites. It's a key finder. Okay. Key finder where there's just a little um, remote, you press it, and then your keys buzz. Okay. I have a friend who the only reason she actually has a home phone is so that she can call her cell phone to find it. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that's the only reason she has it. And every single morning, she, um, I, I lived with her for a little while, and every single morning she had to do it, so I'm pretty sure that's the reason why she had that. Um, other um, friends, yeah, key finders. Um, they're great inventions because if you put your keys underneath something, yeah, you can't see them. And you have to have been paying attention when you put the papers down on top of the keys to be able to actually find them again. So this is where we have lots of great external aims. This here is a portable study carol. You can put it around someone's laptop. So then it blocks out everything around them. Okay. Especially things like movement. Movement tends to grab attention a lot easier. When we talk about memory, rehab, and conversation, certainly um, some of the things that we know are use of natural settings for the rehab um, is better. So if I'm going to have someone in my office trying to do memory stuff with them, it's not necessarily going to generalize to out in their environment. So going into their home, if you're wanting them to remember certain their home, certain things in their homes, go to their home and do the activities with them. Okay. Um, because we just find that the way that our memory system is set up is that it will pull cues from the environment 
in order to be able to um, do the memory task. And so my office, while it's awesome, not so good for cues for someone's home. Um, <coughs> so that's where um, using their natural settings. And then training in the use of memory tools. When people have memory deficits, training takes a long time. Okay? So you can be doing like 50 trials of the exact same behavior to get someone to remember it. And even then, sometimes they still won't be able to. We have a lot of physical memory aids um, and electronics. So this here is a pill dispenser that has a timer on it. Um, has phase sometimes for depending on what the person is on. You might have more complicated systems. Um, but you essentially can have someone who doesn't have um, any cognitive deficits program it in. So some of the pharmacists will be able to do it, family members. Um, some of the clinics that I've worked at, the clinic nurse has done it for the week for the patient um, because this will keep them from taking medications twice, um, especially if they have a combination of memory and attention issues. I can pay attention last time they took their pills. Now it's not a memory, they can't remember if they did it, and so now this is a better way to go to prevent those types of barriers from being made. Electronics. Um, there are a lot of apps that are being created for people with memory difficulties. Um, some are good, some not so good. Um, keeping things as simple as possible for patients is better. So if someone has never used electronics before, this may not be the time to introduce them. Okay. And so that's where, or if you do really simple things like this, versus a smartphone where the person now has to remember their password to get into the phone, then what app, then how to get into that and do things. That's a lot of steps. So if someone's familiar with electronics, a lot of times we can do those things with them. Otherwise, keeping it as simple as possible. A watch that has an alarm on it can be useful. Um, there are now watches that um, will actually have screens that have information on them. So then someone who doesn't have problem deficits can actually program it so that on the watch it appears on the screen. It's supposed to be at this doctor at this time. Um, and so on. So you can actually provide that information to them. Retrieval techniques, these are things that um, probably a lot of people um, remember at school or trying to figure out oh, how do you study the best way possible and things like that. Um, but there are actually retrieval techniques that we can use to cue people. So one of my favorites is, has anyone watched Sherlock Holmes, the new version of it? He uses the Mind Palace. Okay, the Mind Palace is great. It doesn't have to be a palace either. Most of the time it's just a house or a room, but Sherlock Holmes is somewhat arrogant, so he has a mind palace. Um, but essentially, it's you walk someone through a room and you have them visualize a room. Um, and every object in that room has something that will cue them towards the memory that they're going for. Okay? So, for example, if you wanted to remember every part of this fantastic presentation, you could imagine that what I was wearing was the colors of the couch in your living room. Okay. Um, you could imagine parts of my name as being on the bookshelf, on one of the books, and so on. Okay. And you can get it as elaborate as you want, or simple. Um, again, for most patients, going simpler is easier. Having them use a room that they're familiar with is the best way to go with that. Okay. So because you're already familiar with it, it's kind of like with electronics, you don't want to introduce too much new information at once. So all of you can probably describe and imagine in your head your living room or your bedroom or another room that you're really familiar with. And so then starting to tag each of the items in that room with information. Okay? And so when someone forgets something, what they can do is just imagine the room. And what the brain will do is start to use <coughs> all the objects in that room as a way of cueing to that information. And so it's essentially they're building the bridge up to the information that they're actually looking for. Okay? Executive function deficits are another area that cause a lot of frustration for people. So it tends to be one uh, that we try to target usually after we've done attention training. Um, because again, attention is one of those ones that if you can't pay attention, a lot of these things are going to be too difficult to do. Awareness. Awareness of deficits is a big issue. Because if people aren't aware they're having a problem, they're not going to do anything to fix it. Okay? 
And so this is where really becoming aware of the impact of what cognitive deficits a person has, um, how much of an effect slowing is going to have. So when you're driving, should you be driving if you can't process information very quickly? Probably not. Okay. So if someone's having a really bad day where they really feel like they're trying to get through sludge, that's not the best day for them to be driving. So perhaps they should be taking a cab instead. Okay. So awareness is a really important aspect of that. Anticipation and planning. So all of you managed to get here this morning. So you had to anticipate, okay, I gotta get a, a certain time. Okay. I need to have clean clothes or relatively clean, or at least clean enough that other people can't tell that they're clean. Um, you know, the sniff test or whatever it is that you use. Uh, no judgment on that one. It's a Saturday. So what needs to be done before I leave? the house. So a lot of people eat, they have to shower, all those types of things. So all of those steps need to be done. Are there things that typically I would have done both at the same time? Okay. How many people have ever burned toast or something else because you're trying to do too many things at once? Okay. That's something where people can't do this type of planning and multitask. Um, no one multitasks well. I'm going to break your hearts now. The research is not yet done. Any of us multitasking? But some of us can kind of pull it together so that you don't have burning the toast in the morning. Okay. If someone has previously been someone who was a multitasker, they actually have to be taught not to do that um, because they're much more likely to run into problems because they won't be able to monitor well enough um, in order to be successful both with us. <coughs> as well as even planning for what happens if you become overwhelmed or distracted in the middle of whatever it is that you're doing, um, because People need to be able to cut themselves some slack if they can't get through whatever task it is that they need to do. Because otherwise, anxiety starts to set in. Right? They become really anxious because they can't do what they used to be able to do. Um, and so making a plan for that ahead of time um, is essential. So for example, if for some reason you couldn't get breakfast before you had to come here, okay, well, what are the options that I have if I can't do that at home? Okay, well, there's a cafeteria at the hospital, so potentially um, you could go there. Oh, will that make me late? Will that make me anxious? So all of these things that people just naturally do in their heads, something that needs to be planned out ahead of time, especially for important events. And so we can teach patients how to do that, uh, how to go through and plan, um, and make emergency plans of what happens when things go wrong. Okay. Executing and self-monitoring. So, okay, so I did what I was planning on doing. How well did I do it? Um, did I make mistakes? What happened when the mistake got made? Um, for a lot of patients, if they're feeling really anxious and depressed um, and really self-conscious about having cognitive deficits, this is a hard thing when things don't go well. Um, and it could cause a meltdown for them of, you know, I'm just so overwhelmed, I can't function. Um, because for whatever reason, the dryer um, turned off, I close it all the way. I can't handle that. So they become overwhelmed because, especially if they don't have an alternative plan, okay, then that's an overwhelming process. So teaching them how to execute the plan and then monitor at every stage of the plan so that every step is small enough so that if something goes wrong, it's not the end of the world. Okay. Self-evaluation, how well did I handle it? have the therapist evaluate them as well. Because surprisingly enough, we're not that good at self-evaluating. We tend to be really hard on ourselves. Um, and certainly patients will be extremely hard on themselves. Of, wow, like I didn't do that as well as I used to be able to do it, so it was no good. Okay? Um, all of us will have those days where we'll feel like that, but for patients it's even more so. Um, because now they're struggling. Okay? And so that's where something having them um, have, can't touch it apparently. Uh, having a, someone else evaluate them as well. Sometimes this can be useful for family members to do it, um, anyone who's working with them. Um, to be able to give them some self feedback that isn't as negative um, is really useful. And then generalization. How well um, can they do types of tasks that are similar? How well can they do the same tasks with distraction? So we can add in elements of, okay, so if I give them the exact same plan, and now I'm distracted, okay? So I do it 
while the fire alarm is going off. Um, how well can they do it in that situation? Okay. How well can they do it in the next person's office, at home, at school, all these types of things. So we can start to build from there and really get so that um, people can bridge into other areas. Some of the things that we can do, certainly electronic devices, again, there's some planning and organizing applications out there now. Um, a lot of them have been developed um, in, within the brain injury community, but have found some good transfer over to other populations as well. Life coaches are kind of a new profession that's developed because for some people, electronic devices are not appropriate. Um, having someone who can come in, help them plan out their week, um, can be really useful. Uh, certainly, even coaching in terms of having, say, OTs go into the kitchen, teach them how to do the steps of how to make coffee. Okay. Um, having that laid out, having diagrams, uh, this is how you make coffee. Okay. So then, on those bad days, they can use this, versus having to try to struggle through it themselves. Okay. So this is where um, we have the technology now where we can create step by step. You can take pictures of a patient's clothes. This is what you put on first, this is what you put on next, and so on. The sequencing is an issue. So we can use a lot of this technology now to actually start creating tools that are really useful for patients and teach family members how to create them. Three things. Having a space for your keys by the front door. So right when you first come in, that's where you put your keys. Okay. Steve's laughing back there because his basket can be. Yeah. Um, a lot of people do, right? Because then that way in the morning, you're not having to, you know, sit there with a key farther trying to find them through out your door <coughs> or having everyone else in your household come around trying to find your keys, right? So that's where creating routines where someone can do the exact same thing every day, it requires less cognitive energy to do that than it does to have to create new information every day. Using a pen and paper. Sitting down and writing out steps to things. Okay. And so then they can write down um, the information that they need. Teaching them how to make diagrams for themselves. So, a one, this is what I'm going to do at one. A two, this is what I'm going to do at two. And then posting them. I am like the queen of post it notes. I love post it notes. And all kinds of shapes, <laughs> colors, forms. Because that helps to kind of essentially take what's in your front a little bit and put it down on paper. So you don't have to use your front a little bit. And so that's where we can get caregivers um, to actually be able to help people create plans and so on. But then we can put on a post it note on the mirror of, yeah, you need to brush your feet. This is how you do it. Okay. So every activity can be broken down like that. One of the other areas that I wanted to touch on, um, certainly there's lots of other things that we can do in some of the other areas as well, like language and so on, um, but you guys would be here all day. Um, and well, I don't know I'm talking that long, I'm pretty sure attention is bothered by us. So, um, one of the other areas is the use of CBT, or cognitive behavior therapy, um, for the purpose of cognitive rehab. So, this is an area where now what we're trying to do here is really try to reduce some of the emotional distress people are feeling. Okay, so try to reduce some of the depression and anxiety that people have. Um, being able to manage pain is a big part. Being able to manage some of the stress. Having a brain tumor is stressful, both on the patient and the pain okay? um, And we want to reduce that as much as possible because stress will reduce cognitive function. Um, we can do insomnia management through CBT. Um, and we can use it to reduce some of the distress felt during some of the procedures. Chemo is a fun. Okay? People get scared with radiation. People get scared with um, surgery and so on. How many people here like needles? <coughs> a lot of patients have that same fear, okay? if not worse. So we can reduce some of that distress that they're feeling. And then some of the interpersonal stress. Okay. It can be challenging for family members to understand why someone who looks fine has a brain dysfunction. Okay. It's much easier to understand when someone has a cast on their leg that they can't walk. It's an invisible injury, essentially, because it's something that people can't see on the outside. And so it can cause a lot of interpersonal distress because other people just don't get it. They don't get what it's like to slog through mud. 
okay? And so it causes a lot of distress. And so we can really start to reduce some of those extra factors that are then, again, increasing the load on the cognitive dysfunction of the patients. And so it's now becoming more and more popular within a lot of the cognitive rehab programs to have this as an integrated part to try to reduce some of that strain on patients. This is just from Emily Dickinson. Can't compete with Dr. Rubin's <laughs> um, holiday pictures, but um, this is one that I've always loved to purchase. So.